of you. If you have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to pull them out. We're going to be uh, taking another step in our series that we've been working through together. So we're going to be in Matthew 5, if you uh, want to get your Bibles out. Uh, I want to greet those of you who are uh, joining us uh, online and uh, encourage you, those of you in the room and those online, we're going to be celebrating communion at the end of uh, the message time today. And so if you're like me and you're in the room, you're going to get that cup and you're going to want to start now at opening it. And if you're at home, you want to grab those crackers or bread or a little juice and uh, so that you're ready for that when we get to that. Together as a church family, as we have started this new year, we have been stepping through this series, which is really about your health, your inner health, your mental, emotional, and spiritual health. We've been talking about important decisions, choices that you and I uh, are, are need to make in order to journey close with Jesus, but, but it also to thrive in life, not just survive, but thrive. We've been talking about these choices, life's healing choices. This series is based on Matthew 5, where Jesus starts out the Sermon on the Mount, and he makes, makes eight very direct uh, sort of pithy statements where basically Jesus says, I'm going to tell you uh, how to thrive in life. The world's going to give you their opinion. I'm going to tell you the truth about what it takes to thrive in life. Now, we've been looking at these Beatitudes, and I've been chatting with some of you, and some of you aren't happy about the word happy. Uh, for some, the word happy is a little too shallow, uh, a little too circumstantial, uh, you know, based on circumstances, whatever it might be. Uh, for some, the word blessed is way too vague. You know, I don't really know what that means. Here, fundamentally, when we see in the Beatitudes, Jesus saying, happy are those or blessed are those, what he's saying is, th those, those are ways that you and I learn to align and live in alignment with who, who God created us to be. We're, we're functioning as we were created to function we're, we're free from the, uh, uh, the consequences and the, the limits of sin. We're, we're free from the things that, the hurts, the habits, and hangups that stunt our spiritual growth. So we're, we're living fully into how God created us to live, unbound by sin that entangles us, as the writer of Hebrews says, getting rid of that, those things that entangle us. Now, if you uh, have just joined us more recently in the series, let's do a little review. I don't know about you, but it always helps me to kind of say, now, what's the flow and how, where are we and how did we get here? So we started out really quickly. We started out with healing choice number one. This is what we call the reality choice. This is what I call the keeping it real choice, where we're honest about our brokenness and we're honest about the reality that I can't, I can't rid my life of these sinful habits all on my own, okay? That's the reality choice. Based in, in the, the beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit has been getting real about who we are, being, being humble to own that and admit that. Then we stepped into healing choice number two. This is what we, we call the hope choice. This is a choice to believe that God can help us uh, get rid of these and, and heal and, and move past this brokenness, okay? So if the first step's I can't, the second one is God can. Based on the beatitude, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Healing choice number three was what we call the commitment choice. The commitment choice. Consciously choosing now to trust God at his word that he can heal us. We're, that this is where we're leaning into him. We're calling on to him. So I can't, God can. And now this one is the, this, we're going to let him do it. We're going to open our lives and our hearts and let him do it. Blessed are the meek. We're going to say, I need help and, I'm gonna, and God has got to help me because I can't do it myself. Healing choice number four, this was the tough week, house cleaning week, house cleaning week. This is the choice we make 
uh, courageously to be honest about our insides. Uh, be honest about our insides with God and with someone you trust. This is the owning and confessing part. And we're speaking to God what he already knows about us, confessing, and we're sharing that with wisely, remember? Wisely with a trusted friend or counselor or whatever. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. This is a confession, emptying, cleaning out what's in our hearts. And last week, we are healing choice number five, the transformation choice. This is the, I'm going to do it God's way. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk in obedience. He's calling me to live this way. I'm going to live this way and not rely on my old strategies. Okay, I'm going to let God transform me. This is where we resolve to submit to every sort of change God wants to make in our lives. And we're willing to do that hard work. And Sam led us through this last week because it's worth it. It's worth it in the end. Blessed are those, Jesus says, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. It's worth it, okay? Now today, we're picking up with healing choice number six, all right? We're trucking right along, all right? Healing choice number six, this is the relationship choice, okay? Now, this is the choice to do a thorough inventory and an honest evaluation of all our relationships in our lives, okay? Doing an assessment of the status or the condition of all of our relationships with God and with other people. At funerals that uh, I do, sometimes I will encourage those who attend uh, with the reality that funerals give us a rare chance to talk about what it means to be ready for death. And I talk about one of the, 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 key, the key sorts of elements of being ready for death is being at peace in our relationships and peace with our relationships with God, at peace in, with our relationship with ourselves, being at peace with ourselves. Some, some of you aren't at peace with yourself. And, and, and then, of course, being at peace with other people, with being at peace with, with the f- folks that we're in relationship with. And when we're at peace, when all of those kinds of connections, those relationships, it's at that point then, then we're really, we're ready. We're ready, okay? Now, most, most all of us have a few, if not more, relationships that are, uh, how, how can we say, in disrepair. They're, maybe they're not just quite, uh, they're not at peace. We're not at peace with that person. Uh, as we go through life, we have painful experiences with people. Either we, we make bad choices and we sin against them, or they make poor choices and they sin against us. And so it introduces, we introduce wounds into their lives or they introduce wounds into our lives. And if we're not careful, we can begin to build walls and we try, to, we try to keep, protect the pain in our lives. You know, we're already wounded. It's like you get a, you get a bruise or whatever, you kind of protect. You get a broken arm, you kind of protect. We, we build walls to protect ourselves, and we build walls from further injury. There, there are strategies that we implement in our style of relating to protect our wounded self and, and also to guard against anyone else hurting us, okay? That's what happens. And and, and what happens is we end up locking ourselves in a kind of tomb, in a kind of prison. Locking other people out. Sometimes locking God out. So to be, rebuild relationships, to rebuild those relationships, we have, to, we have to begin to tear down the walls. This is really what we've been talking about in this series so far. We've been talking about ways to tear down the walls between us and God, keeping it, keep it real here, and ways to tear down walls between our hearts and other people in our lives. We've been talking about choices, choices that we make that either create or keep us in our sinful habits, in our hang-ups, our hurts, that keeps us sort of locked in. And then we've been talking about 
choices that we can make, making different choices that are, that are better and that allow us to, to live freely, to live as free people and thrive. This relationship choice this week is based on two Beatitudes. Let me put them on the screen for you, or you can look at them in your Bibles. Matthew 5, 7, blessed are the merciful. You see that? Blessed are the merciful. This is the relationship choice. Blessed are the merciful, for they'll be shown mercy. And then Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers. So today, let's keep that swirling around in our frontal lobes. Blessed are the merciful, and blessed are the peacemakers. This, these, this is the foundation for the relationship choice. Really, the choice you and I have today is, uh, is the opportunity to evaluate all of our relationships and seek to forgive those we've wounded Seek, or rather seek to forgive those who've wounded us, right? And make amends with those who we've wounded. You see what's happening here? This, we're doing an evaluation and assessment of relationships and where I've been wronged, we're seeking to forgive and where I've wronged others, I'm seeking to get right with them. Unless uh, doing so, as you see there, would risk further injury, further harm. Sometimes the situations are tricky. And to try to go back and fix it just makes it worse, all right? So there's some wisdom involved in that. Now, let's be real. If, we're, if you and I were going to sit down and begin to think through our life, some of you have a lot of life to think through. I've got more life to think through than I used to. And you, you, you think back over and you start to make a list of the, the ways you've been injured or wounded by somebody, what they did, what they said, an attitude they took or whatever. Um, I mean, as a pastor, I'm, I certainly don't have any of that, but you know, you, you, you can start making a list of the ways that you've been wounded by things people said to you or the way they treated you or whatever, and you start making a list of the things that you know, you've done, you realize, man, I, you know, I've, I've not done well with, in that relationship, and you start making that list. I mean, that exercise would, <laughs> is there an end to that? I mean, that, that would take forever, and the list would be endless. I mean, when you're really honest about it. Why is that? Well, the reality is, as human beings, we don't love well. Even when in our best intentions, we don't love well. In our sinful condition, and because we don't love well, we're constantly hurting each other, we're, we're constantly experiencing woundedness, and we need this, th these, this reality of forgiveness and mercy needs to be in play and, and operational on a daily basis. Forgiveness and mercy, operational on a daily basis, we, to, to those, so those walls can be torn down and new ones won't be erected on a daily basis. Jesus tells a story to illustrate this whole reality in our lives. If you have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to turn over to Matthew 18. Matthew 18. I want to read this story with you. Matthew 18, starting in verse 21. This is the parable of the unmerciful servant. Some of you are familiar with this. Let's, let's refresh ourselves. Peter came to Jesus and asked, How many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times, Peter. <laughs> Up to seven times, Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And then it says, he tells a story. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began to settle, uh, as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Massive debt. <laughs> Massive debt. How do you get that? I have no idea. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. So basically, his stuff sold and his, his family put in prison, sold in slavery. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. 
The servant's master, notice verse 27, took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. 10,000 bags of gold. Massive debt, let him go. But when the servant, notice what happens, 28. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 silver coins. That's like 10 bucks. Notice what he says. He grabbed him, began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, you freak. Verse 29, then he felt a ser fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, I'll pay you back. We use the same words the servant used with the king. He refused. Instead, he went off, had the man thrown in prison until he could, not, he could pay his debt. When the other, servant saw, other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged, and they went and told the master everything that had happened. Then the master called that servant, and he said, You wicked servant, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat you unless you forgive your brother or sister from heaven. Wow. In this story, there's two sobering and, and I would say very challenging truths that Jesus is teaching us as it relates to our relationships and the challenges that we have in forgiveness and forgiving others from the hurts they've caused us, okay? This, we, got, we have to think honestly about this today. The first principle that Jesus shared is simple. It's the big, big idea of the parable, really. Here it is. Because I have been forgiven, I can forgive. That's the moral story. Because I have been forgiven a lot, I can forgive. The foundation for us to be able to forgive this huge catalog, this huge list of hurts and wounds that we've, we've experienced in our lives from, you know, all sorts of people in our lives, spouses, parents, coworkers, whatever, that huge list. The, the, the foundation for us to be able to forgive all of those wounds that have been accumulated is because we have been forgiven. And because we have been forgiven, we can forgive. Think about this story. I mean, I, I read it really quickly. But I want you to reflect on this with me a little further. Here's a servant who worked for a very wealthy king. And he wakes up one morning, and he has no idea it's judgment day. <laughs> he has no idea. He's going to be hauled into the boss's office and he's going to be held account, okay? But he comes in, and the king's going over the books. The master, he's going over the books, and he notifies his servants that he owes them, I mean, what's equivalent to millions of dollars. I mean, the price of gold today is like over $1,800 an ounce. So, you know, 10000 I, mean, I don't know. How do you do the math on that? Millions of dollars. This is a gigantic debt. You'll never be able to pay it off. He'll really never be able to pay it off. And the king says, pay up now, and I want my money. And if you don't, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell all your possessions, and I'm going to put you and your family in prison and sell you into slavery until you pay your debt. Well, the man falls down in his face, right? And he begs for mercy, right? Please, please, you know, forget my debt. I'll, I'll work hard. I'll pay it back. Trust me. I'll pay back every penny. And for some reason, this master forgives his debt. He basically says, I'll, I'll forget it. I'll wipe it out. I'll wipe it off the books. It's done. Go on your way. I'll never bring this up again. You're free. You're released from the debt that you could not pay. Man, we gotta pause right there for a second. Some of you are already making the connections, aren't you? This guy is you and me, the servant. You and I owe a debt to the king, to God, that is ginormous, unfathomable. We really don't get how much we owe. And it's compiled from everything you've ever done or said or thought that's in violation of God's holy character. 
It comes just by virtue of the fact that we're born with a sin nature and we're separated from God and we owe him a debt that we could never pay. It's gigantic. Why did this king in this story forgive this guy's debt? Why does God forgive our debt? Why did he forgive you and why did he forgive me this debt that is so gigantic that we could never pay it back? We could never be good enough. Why should he have mercy on us? I mean, compared to the majesty of God, we're just little insignificant beings. That's all we are. Just, just a That God would have mercy on us is so huge, it's a head scratcher to me. Why? But he did it because of Jesus. The debt you and I owe God did not remain unpaid. It's not like God just turned his back and ignored it. That debt that we owed didn't remain unpaid. The debt you owed didn't remain unpaid. The debt I owed didn't remain unpaid. It got paid by Jesus. And God's holy and righteous character and the justice was met. That debt was paid. See, mercy is not getting the judgment you deserve because God put that judgment on Jesus. Jesus willingly took it. One of the most powerful illustrations of God's loving mercy and forgiveness is the story of the prodigal son. Many of you are familiar with it. You don't need to turn there. I'm not going to read it, but I just want to remind you of it. You're, you're familiar. It was a wealthy man who had two sons, you, you know. The younger one comes into his dad one day. And he says, Dad, I don't really like you, and I don't really like the rules around this house, and I don't really like the values you live by, and I'm kind of done with it. I'm ready to, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go live and do what I want to do, when I want to do it, where I want to do it. And so I want, I want you to give me my half of the inheritance. Remember that story? And remarkably, the father doesn't say, get out of my face, you know, or whatever. Instead, he, it's hard to imagine, but he probably with tears in his eyes, hands over this, to this rebellious son his share of the inheritance. The son goes in, he lives this riotous life, the Bible says, and he, everything that could, he could do to harm, you know, that could, might cause harm to himself does, and then the money runs out, and then all his friends leave. And then he finds himself laying upside down in a pig pen, a Jewish boy in a pig pen, epitome of shame. Then he's lying in this pig pen, and he realizes he's thrown everything away, all that he's given up. He comes to his senses, and he says, I'm going to go back to my dad. But he doesn't think for a minute that his dad's going to be kind to him. He, he makes a plan. He says, I'm just going to go back and say, just treat me like a servant, just, just, so, I can, just so I can live on the farm, just... Just let me serve you. Just let me work for you. You don't, need, you don't need to treat me like a son. So he goes back to his father. The Bible says he, son heads home, and before he even gets all the way to the ranch, his dad's running to meet him. He does this most undignified thing in the story. He gathers up his robe like a skirt, and he starts running to his boy. The Bible says when he found him, he hugged him. He kissed him. He said, welcome home. You belong here. Throws a big celebration for him. Throws a party. Friends, that's how your heavenly father responds when you come to him. I don't know what your preconceived notions are about how God would relate with you when you come to him, even if you've been out in the weeds making stupid choices. We, we, have our, we all have our seasons of that. Here's a Rembrandt, Rembrandt's beautiful painting of, of this reunion of father and son. Have you guys seen this before? 
In this famous painting, you see the son coming back to the father, and he realizes that he's not going to be treated like a servant. Instead, he's going to be welcomed like a son. And, and if you look at this painting really close, it's kind of hard to see maybe as far away as you are to it, but you look at the father who's hugging his son there, and his two hands don't match. They're not the same. You notice that? The father's, <laughs> the father's left hand is stronger and broader and larger like the hand of a father. And his right hand is finer and, and smaller like the hand of a mother. It symbolizes the love of a parent, of a father and a mother, welcoming back their child, the son who's gone away. Isn't that a powerful painting? It's just, just hugging him. Friends, that's how our father treats us when we come to him. That's how he treats you when you come to him. Equally powerful is a sculpture called The Prodigal Daughter. This is a sculpture by Charlie Mackesy, an English sculptor and painter. This gets me as a dad of daughters, big time. About this sculpture, Mackesy writes, this is the story of the prodigal daughter, but it really should be called, it really should be called the running father. Who waited every day for his girl to come home. The daughter who had rejected him so badly, when, but when, she saw, when he saw her from a long way off, he ran to her and he hugged her and he kissed her. I don't know what your preconceived ideas are. I don't know what your conditioned emotional response is. But this is how the Father treats us when we come to him. In either case, the beauty of the story is that the father was waiting patiently, eagerly, scanning the horizon for some sight of his child, his dearly loved one. And when the child comes back, the son or the daughter comes back, the father doesn't greet the child with recrimination. He doesn't say, see, I told you. I told you that's what would happen. Why do you do that? Well, you've, you've brought shame to me, you brought shame to your mother. You've insulted us. You've insulted our way of... I mean, he... Sometimes we think that's how God will respond to us. Like, a, like an earthly father. Like when we come to him, we say, I've blown it. I've messed up. I'm, I'm so ashamed, God. I brought shame on just about everybody but with how I've been living lately, the choices I've been making. We think God's going to be mad or irritated or annoyed. <sighs> But this passage tells us that we have a father, we, we have a king who sees the debt that we owe, sees it full on, and knows that it's enormous, he knows it's gigantic, he knows that we've blown it, yet he does not approach us with anything but open arms that say, come home. Welcome home. You belong here. And he hugs us, and he kisses us, and he welcomes us home. So our first key lesson from the parable of the unmerciful servant is, because I have been forgiven, I can forgive. That's a simple one, right? Easy, right? That's how it works in your life, right? Since you've been forgiven, People offend you, you, you forgive them straightway, yeah? Right? No? Here's the problem with the formula. Here's the problem, or, the problem with the formula. We struggle to forgive people. Sometimes. Let's be honest. I mean, I, I don't always like to forgive. I bet... I bet you're not always quick to forgive. Instead of it working like, well, God forgives me, so I forgive you. What really happens in my life, God forgives me, and then, and then I struggle to forgive you. I have to wrestle with it. 
Not just hours, days, weeks, years. This leads us to the second important truth in this parable, the unmerciful servant here in Matthew 18. It's very chilling. It's it's, it's kind of disturbing. The unforgiving become the unforgiven. In the story, we see the servant receives forgiveness from the king. He's happy. I mean, he's excited. He goes bopping down. He's like, I'm free. Ah! Millions of dollars of debt. Poof. Can you imagine? He's skipping down the road, and then he sees a guy he remembers owes him 10 bucks. Puts him in a headlock. What the what? Pay up now. I'm going to throw you into prison. If you don't pay me 10 bucks right now, I'm going to put you and your family in prison. You know what You're giggling because it's absurd. It's embarrassing to have to admit it, but the truth is when it comes to my sin and my weakness and my brokenness, I want mercy. When it comes to other people's wounding of me and their sin against me, I want justice. I'm mad. I've been wounded, treated unfairly. I would rather hold on to this and use it against you in the future. It's all part of that inventory list I was talking about. Some of of our hurts, I think we've assigned a Dewey Decimal System to them. Oh, that was hurt 846.3. I remember what you did to me that that day. But in this story, the king hears about what this unmerciful servant did, so he calls the first servant back in, right? He says, you evil, wicked man, I forgave you a debt you couldn't pay. I forgave you a debt that you could never, ever pay. Why couldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant who owed you much, much less? So it says here, he threw him into prison to be tormented. He gets gets punished. The NIV translates this tortured. Guys, here's here's the fundamental idea. If you're not forgiving, at the very least, you need to understand. If you're not forgiving people in your life, at the very least, you need to understand that you're creating a kind of torture chamber in yourself. You're going to build a wall around your heart. And if you hold on to resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness, you will build a wall around you, around your own heart, an emotional prison that you will be in and that you will torment yourself in, and it's going to wear you out. One man said this, as long as we're unable to forgive, we keep ourselves chained to the unforgiven. We give them rent-free space in our mind, emotional shackles in our heart, and the right to torment us in the small hours of the night. In the last weeks of my father's life, he was bedridden, and he had he developed uh, a bed sore. And if you've ever dealt with any buddy in that condition bed sores don't look that dramatic on the outside they don't look that bad but inside there's 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 a deterioration of the tissue there's a there's a deterioration that rots away the tissue goes all the way to the bone and then sepsis sets in and then and then which can lead to death Friends, unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment become like bed sores in our lives. Just about everybody has some place in their soul where there's unforgiveness, resentment, and bitterness. And that unforgiveness and bitterness is a prison, is a a poison. 
And it's slowly eating through your healthy relationships in the same way a bed sore eats through the healthy tissue until it gets to the bone and causes death. The bitterness in your life, the resentment in your life, the anger, the hostility that you feel that you will not deal with, that you just keep covering up, it's like a bed sore. It's eating away at the healthy relationships in your life. And one of these days, if you're not careful, you won't know it until somebody comes up to you and says, I'm done. I want out of your life. I want you out of my life. I can't be around you anymore. Friendship dies. Love dies. Marriages die. And the main reason is because of this unforgiving sin of resentment. It's time, friends. It's time to forgive. It's time to forgive. It's time to release the offender. It's time to stop stabbing yourself with the pain that you feel towards those that you cannot or will not forgive. So how do you become a forgiver? How do you let go of the resentment, the bitterness? There's two ways, and and both of them are hard. (laughs) I want to share them with you really quickly. The first one is to nail it to the cross. Take the wound, take the unforgiveness, take the bitterness. Imagine yourself nailing it to the cross of Christ, the one who paid your debt and settled your account. Because he paid for my debt, I can take whatever debt you owe me and I can nail it to the cross. Because of his forgiveness for me, I have the resources to forgive you. In Matthew 18, the servant didn't get another chance. He was thrown into prison. But you have another chance. You have a chance today. And it doesn't really matter who it is you've not forgiven or what the grudge that you're holding on to, it's, it's building up inside of you. You have another chance today to actually begin to release it. Sometimes it's a process. Begin to release it. The second step, start right now. Start today. I'm going to ask those who are helping me close the service today with, in the worship, on the worship team to come on up because we're going to take some time to reflect here for a few moments. And I want you to just listen to the music and, and spend some time communing with God. Ask Him to bring to your awareness. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Ask Him to bring to your awareness the face or the name of a person that he wants you to forgive today. Maybe you already know the name. Maybe you're saying, God, this is the person. I don't know how in the world I'm going to release him. I don't know how I'm going to release her. But this is the person, God. I need you to help me release them. That person might be you. Now I'm going to ask you either in your, on your device in the freehand notes section or on some paper you've got, maybe in the margin of your Bible, write that person's name down. Write that person's name down. You and God do some business. Take your time. You might be thinking that the name or the face that God's bringing to you this morning is, you might be thinking, but this person doesn't deserve forgiveness. But isn't that the point? They wouldn't need forgiveness if they deserved it. As I said, it's a process. You may have to imagine yourself nailing this again and again and again and again to Jesus' cross. But friends, please realize a counselor can't, can't release you from the bitterness you're holding on to. Your pastors, they can't release you from the resentment you hold on to. Your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your best friend, whatever, can't release you. 
Nothing releases us other than taking it to the cross. This is hard for us, Lord Jesus. It shouldn't be. We get it. <laughs> it shouldn't be. But we struggle and we need your spirit to fill us and empower us. Keep making us willing. Keep moving us along. Keep maturing us and growing us. And we thank you, Lord Jesus. <laughs> You're our king who has forgiven us mountains and mountains and mountains of debt. In fact, today, Lord Jesus, we have the chance to celebrate your incredible work on the cross that teaches us and models for us this power of forgiveness. If you guys have your cups available, Grab them and pull back that top layer. Let's grab that wafer out. Jesus, we hold this bread in our fingertips and we remember your words in the upper room that night when you said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we remember today how much we've been forgiven as fuel for our forgiveness of others. We remember you as we eat together. Then we hold this cup, Lord Jesus. We, we remember your words that directly call this cup out as a representation of your blood that was shed on the cross for us. The new covenant in my blood, you said. We thank you for your willingness to forgive so much. And we ask you to continue to make us willing to forgive in our lives as we drink together. Keep working with us, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your promise of your presence and your faithfulness in our lives. And we open ourselves to your good work, moment by moment. In your name, amen.